Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're going to give it just a few minutes and then we'll start um, with today's our community stories about Haiti. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for um, the fifth in our series about um, uh, historically black neighborhoods in Durham. Today's we um, today's session is about Haiti neighborhood, which um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And it's a great time to learn more about the history of that area and also hearing directly from um, some of the community members who have um, just really beautiful stories um, and moving stories. Uh, from their experiences. Um, today, uh, let's see, I'll go ahead and slip to this slide. Um, it's November 13th, 2020, when we're recording this. Um, if you're watching on Zoom, we encourage you to share any comments that you may have in the chat. Um, there's also a Q&A feature. If you have questions, um, we'll take questions with the speakers towards the end of today's event. Um, I'm Laura Biediger. I'm with the City of Durham um, Neighborhood Improvement Services Department Community Engagement Division. Um, thank you for uh, joining us today. So far we have over 100 people um, that are joining us to learn about this history live, which is very exciting. Again, this is uh, the fifth in our series. Today's recording and other recordings will be available on our website, durhamcommunityengagement.org and also the City of Durham's YouTube page. That we're doing today's um, session to learn more about our communities like Haiti, and this is all part of the city's work to um, have more equitable community engagement because engagement shapes the city programs and policies that shape our communities and our lives. So um, one of those pieces is working more collaboratively with other city departments, the county and other community organizations so that we can engage residents in a holistic manner um, because people lead very full lives and we need to engage them in, in all of those ways. Also working with community groups and community partners to design and lead their own engagement because the people who know best how to do engagement are community members themselves. And then, like I said, today's um, uh, event is part of our, our community stories uh, session because our communities have very uh, long and deep histories and um, it's nice, especially in today's environment, to stop and, and learn more about that. To learn more about our equitable community engagement, again, you can visit our, our website, durhamcommunityengagement.org. Now for today's session, um, we have uh, the speakers are Angela Lee. She's executive director, executive director of the Haiti Heritage Center, Dr. Henry McCoy from NCCU, and then our two um, residents um, and or Haiti um, Haiti experts, I will say, are Anita Scott Neville and Reverend Casimir Brown. Um, and I will turn this over to them and start with Angela. Thank you, Laura. Thank you all for, for tuning in and thank you, my fellow panelists. As Laura said, I am Angela. I am the executive director of the Haiti Heritage Center. You see an outdoor um, image of the facility here. I um, have served as executive director since 2013. And as the marquee indicated, we love this place. Haiti has been an integral part of the community, not just Haiti community, but Durham community. The, the center is a cultural arts and arts education venue that was established in 1975. And um, I think it's a tribute to 
the founders that they had the vision to um, to fight for and insist that the former sanctuary be preserved and used for cultural um, arts and cultural enrichment. A couple of things I want to say before I go into that more. I think it's interesting that the city of Durham was incorporated in the same year that the church was founded, 1869. Uh, Edie and Markham, a pastor, established a church on the site where the building stands now in 1869 and began worshiping uh, under a brush arbor. And the brick and mortar was, was eventually built and reopened in 1891. So this facility has stood for a long time and it has represented all of the resilience and all of the strength and all of the beauty and all of the love that um, the community uh, in Haiti has, has exhibited, has demonstrated and, and has represented all of these years. Before I go on further though, I would like to take time to acknowledge that um, this year, well, we've lost three people who were very important, not just to Haiti, but to the community. Uh, Ed Stewart, who's a past board chair of Haiti. Uh, Kenneth Edmonds, who was the owner and operator of the Carolina Times newspaper. And most recently, uh, John Skippy Scarborough uh, of Scarborough Funeral Homes. Mr. Scarborough is also, was also a, a board member for Haiti, but more than that, uh, he often uh, took his time and joined us when we would call on him to help with tours. Uh, one of the things that we offer year round are historic tours and Mr. Scarborough always joined us when his time allowed and just shared so much of his experience, so much of his knowledge, so many of his stories growing up in Haiti. And um, people loved having Mr. Scarborough uh, as part of those tours. Um, they will all be missed dearly. As I said, Haiti is a cultural arts and arts education venue. We offer core programs in performing and visual arts. Some of the images you see here um, to the left of, to my left of the screen, uh, blues, that's a part of the music series that we offer. And that's Tito Jackson, who was, who was here a year or two ago uh, as part of the Blues and Roots uh, concert. We also have dance, not only African dance, but we have a Women at Work production every year, which celebrates Women's History Month. Uh, also part of the music series, the Durham Symphony with Maestro William Curry, who is the only African-American symphonic conductor in the South. A beautiful, beautiful orchestra. And we also have Poetry Slam team, Jambalaya Soul. They perform at Haiti every month, but they also compete nationally. We have a film festival that is multiple days each year. And um, this year's film festival will be presented virtually. It'll be in 2021, as will our Con Kwanzaa program, which is also a program that we offer every year, December 26th. Um, we also have artist exhibitions, and these are some of the artists who have, who have been exhibited at Haiti, and they do a fabulous job every year. And the lower screen, we have vendors at many of our events, and this is just a scene from one of our events. The um, the door panels uh, to your to my right um, reflect and represent some of the programs that we offer at Haiti. So in addition to those core programs, we offer the tours, as I said, but we also offer facility rentals in the space and we have lease tenants. So we're busy. We even have, um, we've even had two churches that worship in the performance hall on Sundays. So open seven days a week. For more information, please visit Haiti, H-A-Y-T-I dot org. We're also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, I want to say from a statistical standpoint, um, we know that there's systemic racism throughout our life, but there's also a real resource disparity in the arts. Uh, for example, 2% of all cultural institutions in this country receive 60% of all contributed revenue, whereas 4% of arts funding goes to groups that serve communities of color. 
So that is a disparity that continues to grow. And that's why it's, it's a, a further tribute to the resilience that we have been able to withstand recessions. We've, re, we've withstood um, political views. We've withstood a lot over time and we're still, we're still standing. We still represent the community and um, we represent it not just through music and dance, but through activism. We've had some amazing um, people who have come through uh, the Haytai community and the Haytai Heritage Center. And uh, it's just been an honor to, to represent Haytai and to, to welcome folks like the late uh, Congressman John Lewis to our space. So um, I also want to say that we've had some strong partnerships because without community collaboration, our organization would not have the strength and would not be as solvent as it is. So we have partnered over the years with the Durham Library, with the Museum of Durham History, with North Carolina Central University's College of Arts and Sciences, with Duke Performances and Community Affairs, and with other organizations, um, arts organizations and um, non-arts organizations. So hopefully that gives you a sense of who Haytai is, what we do. The building stands on the corner of Fayetteville Street and Lakewood Avenue, very close to the 147 freeway. You will hear more about that as we proceed. Um, and again, I thank you for taking time to learn more about who we are, what we do, and about our community. This is a map where the yellow circle around Haytai uh, represents uh, communities of color. I don't think it's a fully inclusive map, but I'm going to um, ask either Anita Neville or, or Reverend Casimir Brown to, to weigh in on this slide. Okay, um, this is uh, Reverend Brown. Um, what you see is a portion of the area designated as Haytai. Uh, Haytai was basically what we considered back in the day when we lived was the business portion of our community although Haytai extended a lot further uh, as it headed on out, even towards where South Point is located today. There were many black farmers who uh, produced and brought their wares to town to be sold, even tobacco. Yes. But for this particular area, this was the high point in terms of productivity for the black community. In it today, it could be compared to the city in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was burned down back in the day, wherein there were Blacks who were being progressive. Uh, most folk don't realize this was all during a time of segregation, mm -hmm. where everything was supposedly separate, but not necessarily equal. Uh, in Haiti, we had all sorts of businesses, from food and clothing, to medical, uh, to even you know whatever business people chose to go in. Uh, one business that was brought to the development of Haiti back in the mid and late 50s was brought by my father, a new science brought to the community called chiropractic. He brought in the first black chiropractic uh, facility and office back in about 1957 and worked there for 50 plus years. Now, he wasn't the only one. There are many others who brought in businesses and aspects into this area. <clears throat> And also what made it a very crucial point was because it's high in education. You notice there's what is called Quidditch Elementary School, but was also the first site of Hillside High School back in the day before it became Quidditch. And in addition to that, we also have North Carolina College, which is now North Carolina Central University, which has been there ever since the beginning of the early 1900s. So we see that it is a big area the picture doesn't really do it justice, but it gives you some idea as to what exists as far as what we know as the Haytai community. I'll turn it over to Sister Neville at this time. Reverend Brown, you I think you co you covered that um, uh, the the map very well. Um, what stands out as most important to me is that the yellow circle that you're looking at is is the hub or um what the business the business activity that went on within that yellow circle uh supported black business people black families black churches 
that extended far beyond that yellow circle. Uh, most significantly, the corridor, what we know as uh, Black Wall Street, Parish Street, and then uh, leaving uh, that yellow circle uh, to the furthest extent of Federal Street, well, what used to be called Federal Road, which is now Federal Street, all the way out to uh, currently the streets of South Point. So, um, so you know, Reverend Brown and Anita gave a great kind of background to essentially kind of, you know, what Hay is known for. And so, um, you know, from a business standpoint, I want to give you kind of a quick background um, of what we just saw from, from that, that mapping standpoint. Part of what made um, Durham's hay tie um, so unique is the fact that, you know, we had this incredible entrepreneurial ecosystem that was unique um, to any black community in the United States. We hear a lot about Tulsa, Oklahoma, but really the this kind of ecosystem that um, that um, that Haiti had was incredible. And really, if you think about it, the fact that the name is Haiti. So for those who don't know, um, you know, originally the country of Haiti was spelled H-A-Y-T-I. And so if you think about the country of Haiti, you think about the fact that Haiti uh, as a, um, uh, or that Haiti Haiti as a country is a, is the first and only country ever created um, where former slaves revolted and won and took over the country. And so the small community, small black community in Durham would actually uh, themselves after that shows you the kind of ambition that they have. And, and largely um, the Haiti community was like a, an island in the South surrounded by um, segregation and things of that nature. But you, the things that anchored this community uh, really was this of the intersection between education and entrepreneurship, which is what you you heard uh, Reverend Brown just um, mentioned, and so um, that's why you had these different institutions, the the, the schools, and and the um, the businesses and things of that nature. But um, you know, I wanted to start out kind of with this quote that W. Du Bois um, gave when he came in 1912, and really I won't read it word for word, but basically it, it, it identifies the fact that Durham was a unique community where you could come and actually wake up in the morning. And you had black, um, it says black men, but you had black men and black women um, doing uh, really work um, and selling products and goods in a way that uh, folks um, in other places were not. And so, if you know the history, W. Du Bois and, and, uh, and Booker T. Washington didn't agree on many things, but they both agreed that Durham was the most um, incredible community um, in the country for African Americans as well as for progress. You have something to say, uh, Anita? Well, uh, yes, and, and, and I, I like um, the suggestion about um, what it felt like as a Black person in those days to, to wake up. It, it, um, it leads right into my personal experience. Um, uh, Laura, thank you for the slides and for the research uh, you, you have seen, and the internet does share some great illustrations of what Haiti used to look like. But um, for those of you who are from Durham, and I think more importantly, younger people, if you could just imagine for a moment having a center of the town, which without a doubt <laughs> invited you and was a place where you felt at home. This was my experience because uh, I am the firstborn of just one of the black business owners on Pettigrew Street, which was sort of the uh, Pettigrew Street um, embodied um, the biggest unbroken line of black owned businesses. Um, um, in the late 1950s, uh, Elbert Turner, who was known then as Pops Turner, came to Durham. He was a professional baseball player who played for the National Negro Leagues. He migrated to Durham and he married Viola Turner. And just as an aside, Viola Turner was the first female to serve on the board of directors for North Carolina Mutual. But they were like a lot of other names that we know in Durham, they were entrepreneurs and progressive uh, uh, in. Uh, black business people in our community. Pops 
as he was known by everyone, started a retail storefront business at 438 East Pettigrew Street. Uh, that business was known as Turner's Beauty and Barber Supply. Uh, Mr. Turner owned that business until his passing in February of 1970. Uh, a couple of years before his passing, um, he met my father, Joseph Scott. Do we, do we have that slide, Laura, of, of 438 Parish Street? Uh, there, there you are. The picture on the left is when business was booming. And I was one of those young um, black children who woke up in Durham and knew, especially on the weekends, where my place was. Um, I, I, and you'll see, I'm not pictured in, in the photo that you're looking at. You see my brother, my father's only son, out of six children, and one of my sisters, out of five girls. And then to the far right is a picture of my mother. Both my parents have passed. A lot of you who are from Durham and who have been here for a while may recognize my father who is in the center there from the Durham County Courthouse. He retired as bailiff. That's a job that he took after urban renewal forced him out of his black business ownership. Mr. Turner passed, my father inherited the business and worked with Mr. Turner's wife, Miss Viola, to learn the ropes and to become solvent there on Pettigrew Street. The business, as you see it on the left, was flanked by Mr. Pee Wee's shoe shine shop, by Elvira's Blue Dinette. Further down Parish, I mean, uh, Pettigrew Street was the Biltmore Hotel, Grill, and Drug Store, the Regal Theater, the Green Candle Restaurant. There was grocery stores. We've, we've mentioned the Carolina Times and Service Printing Company, which worked in tandem to produce the Carolina Times, which next year will celebrate its 100th, uh, 100th year. Um, also significant was Pettigrew Street and, and Haiti in general was a place where um, black activism, uh, think tank uh, politicians were supported, were, were groomed. Um, all of this happened in, in, on, on Pettigrew Street. Further down, we had uh, WAFR FM radio was developed and found its first home there in 1971 in Haiti on Pettigrew Street. Um, before that, we had WSRC AM radio. But what I, what I want to make sure that you have a good picture of is that this was a thriving hub of life, of promise, of business for the Black community. Um, no part of our community could really survive without interdependence on the other, but insofar as the Black community's contribution to Durham, all you had to do was come to this part of Haiti and just look around. The, the picture to the right that you're looking at now represents Turner's storefront just prior to demolition as they prepared uh, for, uh, to demolish the business, uh, businesses that remained there. Lots of businesses worked hard to survive the plan for 147 and urban renewal. Those that did survive were able to be relocated just behind uh, the Haiti Heritage Center in an area known as Tin City. My father and others, unfortunately, were not able to survive that transition. Um, a, a lot of um, political and economic changes happened to make that survival difficult. One that I remember 
was the lack of insurance coverage for the business people there. Um, the, the list of businesses on that corridor um, ju just goes on and on. I believe just prior to the demolition, there were 54 thriving businesses on that corridor alone. But what we need to understand is that while when we think of Haiti, we think of a certain area. For the black community, that area had tentacles out into the community wherever we found members of the, of, uh, of the black community of Durham. Um, I'm gonna stop because I could go on and on. <laughs> Thank you. And so, um, so just to kind of piggyback off what Anita said, I mean, so um, really, you think about you can't think about Haiti and the growth of Haiti without understanding that Haiti grew out as a you know after the end of slavery and as black folks who had been you know Stagville was such a huge plantation here in Durham, the black folks um, left the plantation and began buying property, um, first leasing property from from um, white um, uh, folks and then ultimately buying it. And so, um, really. Um, um, I always, I travel a lot and talk to different folks of, of black entrepreneurs, things of that na nature. And there were a number of, of what were called black wall streets around the United States, but Durham was really unique and, and, and it was really seen by, by so many experts as this real hub. And so as you, you know, at its height, um, there were, you know, well over 300 black businesses and entrepreneurs and institutions. Which is one of the things that really anchored Durham, um, Haiti in a unique way was the fact that we had educational institutions. Um, Durham had the first um, black high school hillside that, that actually ended up going to the 12th grade, um, you know, which is standard right now, but, but you, know, um, you know, before um, that, it, you know, black school primarily went to 11th grade. Um, uh, we, were, we had the world's largest black business, um, really up for much of the 20th century, which was North Carolina Mutual Insurance. And so um, the world's largest black business was here in Durham. We were known as the capital of the black middle class. Um, think about this, Durham was in the South in the middle of segregation, yet we were a net um, gainer of black folks. Now think about the great migration when blacks left out of the South to go North. Durham had black folks coming in here largely to work for North Carolina Mutual and to kind of find um, their way forward. And we had more, more black millionaires per capita than any other place in the United States. It was known as a city on the hill for the black community. And so I, I wanna give you to, as kind of piggyback on Nita, I wanna give you some context of just how special and unique um, the Haiti community was um, you know, from other places. You can go to the next slide, Laura. Um, so really part of what made them so unique and special was that, um, that Durham had a, a financial anchor unlike some other places. So we had, Durham, had, black community had its own cash. Um, no Cloud Mutual Insurance um, as a, as a, um, uh, 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 the world's largest um, black business for so long had capital that went back into the community. McCanson Farmers Bank uh, had capital went back in the community. And so that gave a certain anchoring to the community that was so unique from other places. Did you want to add something, Anita? Or Reverend? I, 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 re I recall very well, um, my father and his co-workers having an economic challenge. I have been, I've walked into mechanics and farmers many day and had my father be able to have the attention of Mr. Wheeler. I mean, who, how, how do, can we do that today? Go to a bank for a loan or for some financial advice or support. Can we do that today? And one, see the president and two, come out with some, some help. Uh, that's an experience that I know that I've seen firsthand and that not only my father, but other black businesses uh, uh, had benefit of, as you said, uh, having our own money or our own financial institution support our ongoing. I think that the biggest asset for Black Durham at that time was the institutions of finance, especially North Carolina Mutual and Mechanics Farmers Bank, because it was the only place where Blacks could just do any kind of business whatsoever. Um, Mechanics and Farmers Bank is still crucial in the Black community. But what was even more crucial in those days was the people's connection in terms of faith 
and how the church has served as the base of all of these uh, different types of businesses that took place in Haiti. And if it had not been for the churches such as St. Joe and White Rock and other Baptist and Methodist churches around, uh, a lot of these things probably would not have happened. Uh, there was a communal sense through faith as well as through economics, which made uh, Haiti stand out. And if it had not been for the people of Haiti who trusted in the institutions, the institutions would not have lasted. Uh, as I recall, during the days when the depression was in and other banks in our state, as well as in the country went under, uh, mechanics and farmers did not go under and stayed floating and, and, and credible during the times of depression. So we see the resiliency of economics in our community. And also if it had not been for the people in the community who used the institutions, uh, this would not have taken place. Yeah. Did you have anything, Angela? Or, uh, or, or, uh, no, I, I mean, that's absolutely right. And, and um, um, some of those institutions like Mechanics and Farmers Bank are still here. They're still standing. They, they, they've relocated, but they're still operating. And, and you know, so I want to lift that up as well. Um, and going back to that quote that you started out with <clears throat> describing, Henry, um, not just not just being able to build a community, but so much of the uh, distinction architecturally. So for example, the, the Haiti Heritage Center, that structure, it's, it's Haiti is on the Register of National Historic Landmarks, but part of what makes it unique is, is the, the beautiful, you know, from the, 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 the bricks that the Fitzgeralds um, brought over and installed to the interior with the pressed tin ceiling with the gold, I mean, just a very beautiful space. So there was a lot of, um, I, I've seen pictures of the uh, Biltmore, beautiful hotel from what I've seen. So not just being able to, to build and not just being able to thrive, but to, to have the, the beauty and the, the skills and the talents and the, the vision. I mean, just as, as Henry said, you know, the Haiti community was very unique in many ways. And I think for me, that's what stands out. Just, just visually. And I say one thing about that, Angela, to that point, and, and you, you mentioned the bricks. Um, there was a, um, a family, the Fitzgerald's family, that actually um, had a very prominent brick making company, Black family, um, that did bricks not only for the you know the the, the buildings and some of the buildings in Haiti, but also American Tobacco and and uh, other prominent buildings. And, and those individuals contributed to um, you know the construction of um, you know the churches and things of that nature. And so. There was a this kind of um, cycle that that went. So you know you had the you know a hotel, the Biltmore Hotel Theater. You had you know Spate Service Station, which I'm sure Anita, Anita has something to say about. But you know Doug Spate <laughs> and Joy Spate, who are like fifth generation entrepreneurs here, right. um, are family members of Spate. I, I don't live too far from where the, the Spate is now. You want to say something, Anita? Uh, I wanted to say, and I hope we do have some. Uh, North Carolina Central University students watching today, uh, Spate's Auto, the late the Theodore Spate and his brothers started that. It was not only a filling station, but those of us back in the day who had these big oil drums that that our homes were heated by oil, this they, we were serviced by Mr. Spate, the black community. It started out as the pure oil company. And then the next uh, location was there at the corner of Pilot and Fayetteville. And that was significant because there are many graduates of then North Carolina College who can talk about Mr. Spate's benevolence and support of our students being far away from home, maybe not having the money to fix their cars, to buy gas, and how many people that he helped. Mm -hmm. um, the last site of this service station is at the corner of Fayetteville and Barbie Road. And um, uh, Henry, you mentioned uh, Doug and Joy, um, who are my neighbors, my friends, Mr. Spate, um, was my deacon in uh, and and was part of the founders of the church where I have membership, Community Baptist. And to go back to the comments that Reverend Brown made, that the economics and the and the faith uh, base in our community went hand in hand to helping us thrive those days. 
That's incredible. And so I guess we, you know, we can kind of, as we, because I'm sure we want to talk about kind of what happened, right? But I think part of what is important to recognize here is that, you know, I mean, this was not just some postcard, right? I mean, this was an actual community. These were families and people and kids and things like that. The Carolina Times, one of the great things that it did was it offered a voice to the Black community and, and a way for people to understand what was going on. And, and so, that aspect of, of hey Ty also was unique in terms of this printing press and being able to to share information and, and and things of that nature so so it really was a a a, a incredible enclave are you um move on um laura uh, to next slide um, maybe to the next slide uh, and so again this is just to show you uh, and go back one laura real quick this is just to show you these are the, the african owned restaurants um and if i you know from what i can I think you know the chicken box, which is now the chicken hut, is maybe the only restaurant listed here that still is in existence, and certainly you know it, it's moved. And but part of this is to understand really just how um, diverse the 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 entrepreneurs were. And if you think about this as an ecosystem, young kids were able to see um, people that look like them create businesses of all kinds, and they decide they wanted to create businesses. And one of the things I I say before we move on to the kind of dismantle is that I remember talking to some some of the visual like Reverend Brown and, and Anita who grew up in Haiti and one of the things that struck me was to hear these stories about that these kids grew up feeling like they could do anything. And I was like, well, how'd you grow up feeling like you could do anything and be anything? They said, because I saw it around me. And so that's one of the things that we are sorely missing now because the current state of entrepreneurship is often gets put in a box when it's connected to black folks as opposed to understanding that black folks can do anything anybody else does. And so, um, Anita, Reverend? Well, the 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 uh, black experience in terms of business has always been a uh, design or a gem that has always been used by the nation of America to begin with. Uh, that dates back to the days of slavery as they watched how the workers worked. That's how they were able to program how they were going to do their jobs and businesses. As time went on and the Civil War passed, and even at the uh, different sites that took place in Durham, uh, that same type of attitude persisted and kept going as a means of motivation. So you had to have a religious as well as an economic foothold in order to maintain that thought. And so with uh, Haiti, it just developed. Uh, now, it didn't develop all by itself now. There had to be a special kind of relationship between Blacks and whites during that day. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it was segregated, there was a relationship between Blacks and whites in Durham, which also facilitated not just the growth in Black Durham, but also the growth in White Durham. Mm -hmm. uh, it was still segregated. It was still divisive. Mm -hmm. But there were those who were looking toward the future in terms of trying to make Durham grow. In that future look, it didn't look very good on our behalf because in our community, we lost more than anybody else. Um, it, I, I've noticed how they've gone from two words in, in cleaning up a city to one word now. Back in the day, it was redlining. Then it became urban renewal. Now it's called gentrification. But it's the same process through which Black communities are pretty much if not destroyed, somewhat put back or eliminated in order for whatever they call progress. And this progress hurt Haiti area so much so that you know a lot of businesses, they went out of business and never were able to come back again. Mm -hmm. And it also changed the tax rating or the tax bracket for any other businesses in that area which forced them to go out. Uh, we also see that even today with uh, uh, North Carolina Mutual and Mechanics and Farmers, uh, their worth is not as strong as it used to be simply because participating in an integrated society has not always proven itself to be to our improvement, but more or less to our detriment where we have to struggle a little harder to do even more so to get where we were in the past. So I'm hoping that with this type of uh, understanding coming now that we can move from this point forward in revitalization in Haiti because it's needed and necessary for us, given that things are still changing, but hopefully changing for the better for even minorities in our community. Uh, it, it is important for us because 
like you're saying, there's so many who are not understanding, especially youth, what it was like just growing up in this community. For me, as you were saying before, it was it was common to see people trying to open businesses, trying to get started. People who have been long standing in the community. I mean, I delivered papers to John Wheeler's house or Henderson's house or people who worked for North Carolina Mutual Mechanical Farmers and uh, school teachers there. We saw these people on an everyday basis and we went to church with them. So we understood our relationship together and how they were trying to forge ahead. Even with Judge Pearson, he was one of our great members at St. Joseph. These people inspired me to do what I'm doing today. And it's kept me going up until this time. So it is important for us as a people in our own community to revisit some of this in terms of trying to expand beyond the devastation that has taken place. And I guess later on in this, um, in this uh, display today, you're going to see how things have changed over the years. Well, they popped up the maps already. So you see in this map here of how the housing and businesses all coalesced together right in there. See Pettigrew and Fairwood Street. And Fairwood Street was the main place for businesses with doctors, lawyers, uh, shop owners, and just like Pettigrew, all existed. But if you look over at the picture on the right, you see how things have pretty much disappeared. And that's because of a freeway that was just shot through and that was not the original layout or the original place for the freeway to go in the first place. But given what has already happened, there's nothing we can do to change the past. And we're hoping that what's what available today that we can take it a step beyond to revisit some of the sites in terms of how we were progressive in those days. And there was a lot of progress made. I mean, you mentioned the fact about the brick uh, laying, uh, people had their own brick factory. Uh, there were a whole lot of businesses uh, similar to that and even more so. And it's just sad to see that we don't have as many black businesses today giving any kind of real support in the community because your, your competition is so great. And most money in the black community doesn't stay in the community anymore. It goes out. So it's kind of hard, but it's not impossible. And I'm hoping that with this, you know, we can help revitalize the spirit of even our children and our youth. And it would be important educationally if they could learn about this. Uh, that's one thing that we are suffering from as far as education. These things are not taught. So if they're not taught, you never learn them. If you don't learn them, you never know them. If you don't know them, you won't have any desire to even think about them. But if it's put in with an education, our children can see and have a better view of not only their history, but themselves as well as their potential. Let me stop right there. I want to cut it about out. Well, I say I say this because I think it's important to what you say because I, I recognize this at NCCU School of Business myself. I teach I teach entrepreneurship. I lead the entrepreneurship program, and it became very apparent to me that even though NCCU is one of the anchor institutions that still exists within Haiti, mm -hmm. that and I'm in the School of Business at HBCU, that these students were coming in without understanding this history, and right. so it became important for me to actually actually start that as the foundation of the program that mm -hmm. that conversation good, so they can understand good. about that and uh and so you know you see this can you go back real quick laura i want to i want to make a comment about the previous slide so you see this kind of before and after and you know there was a lot of different voices that came about in terms of you know what's happening and so i, I do want to say this that that part of the durham freeway you know it was kind of a, a second tier strategy in a lot of places for the destroying the black community, right? You know, some mm -hmm. places like Tulsa and Wilmington and other places like that, they just burned it down to the ground. Right. Their strategy was, well, let's, you know, we have federal dollars. We are, we say we need a highway, let's run a highway through it. So it happened in Durham, it happened in Richmond, it happened in Bur Bur Birmingham, Bur Birmingham, it happened in LA. Mm -hmm. And so this is part of that, but I, the thing I wanted to point out was see the homes, the things on the left-hand side, the uh, previous um, kind of picture, single family homes, these are businesses, things like that. But we know that the black community still suffer from needing more capital. And so part of the strategy was, okay, we're going to revitalize and, you know, let's build out better. But if you look at the right hand side, the highway came through, destroyed hundreds of homes and businesses. The big slot of, of kind of those little white places you see is what we know as Fayetteville Street Apartments, right? The Fayette Place mm -hmm. um, housing uh, project. And so I said to say that, that what is supposedly going to be an equal trade-off, we're going to you know, we're going to work together and re rebuild is that when you turn out people individual homes, then you rebuild as public housing and put those people 
that's not an equal trade-off. And no. yet that's that's no. part of the challenge that we see over time is that they're somehow you know trying to kind of kind of slip one past you and say, Oh yeah, we did rebuild, we did do this, but we put everybody in public housing. So if I see Anita like she wants to stay uh, no. Uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, matching my, my childhood walk down memory lane with, with uh, the facts and figures that you and Dr. Brown, uh, Reverend Brown are, are sharing. Um, it is, we, we, we drive through down Fayetteville Street, Pettigrew, on through downtown, and we see what we see, but we really have no idea. And, um, as Durham, like other cities, are thriving and are in a mode of redevelopment, oh, how wonderful it would be to um, replace and revitalize what was, e even just a portion of what was. Um, uh, the uh, Durham's, uh, not the old five points, which you all know what old five points is, but the downtown five points, uh, the BU Cafe is um, a remnant of what it used to be like uh, and, uh, and even more significant because not only is it a black owned business, uh, uh, it's the, the property itself is black owned. And so I just wanted to say that to uh, for everyone's consciousness and awareness, so we could support it. It's it's just it, that's that's our way of hanging on to what was. Just one example. As you see in the picture that's already posted, this is the community I grew up in. Mm. I recognize my church, St. Joe, right there in the middle. Yeah. I remember those businesses all down the street beside St. Joe. And across the street from St. So Bechaser's Beauty College, there's also uh, the Gulf Station by Mr. Dawson, and all the homes that were in the back of the church and on the side of the church. And that's just behind St. Joe. You got to realize there's another church, a Baptist church, right down the favorite street, which was White Rock. White and Rock. The same layout behind them as we had behind us. And these were all homes and businesses right together. Now, you see today there's nothing that resembles this layout other than maybe new housing that went up which does not compare but there's nothing that resembles what was there before which could have been kept alive if it wanted to be but when there's no desire you know you can't fight change especially when you're not in a position to stand up against it but it does remind us how not just progressive but also reminds us how people thought about their future and how yes. well they tried to plan for the future for their children. And they expected us to come behind them and carry on. But things do change. And there's not much we can do about that. But I thank the Lord for keeping St. Joe because it's the only historic place that exists right there in Atai. There's nothing else there standing other than the library, which is down about another block and a half. But it came way after St. Joseph and White Rock were built. So this is this history looking us, looking me in the face and just letting us know how we were doing and what we were about in those days. Right. And let me add, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to what you all have said with regard to social and economic justice, there's the matter of environmental justice. And that's really important in our communities. Mm -hmm. You look at this picture as, as Anita and Reverend Brown recalled, and all of the trees, all of the landscape, those things are lost. And as they're rebuilding mm -hmm. with public housing projects, you know, there's, there's very little, if any, attention paid to the environmental justice. So we know that in order to have a healthy community, we need a community where people feel safe and free to get out, to walk, to ride bikes, to move around. And if we don't have that infrastructure that encourages that, then we're not going to have healthy communities. And we've seen the statistics. We know that, you know, we're disproportionately impacted by health disparities and things like that. So environmental justice is also key. So the city of Durham years ago um, created a cultural master plan that was going to include a whole lot of upgrades and improvements to the Fayetteville Street Corridor. And it was before the recession of 2007-8. Now, it, we, have, um, we have been really advocating, and that's where that, that 
community activism is so important, um, advocating for the city to revisit that plan so that they can shore up the sidewalks and do things that, that um, will reflect the need for environmental justice, you know, planting trees and planting flowers and shrubs and things to, so that people are encouraged to get out and be a part of a healthier community. Let me let me say this because I actually know there's there's questions that's popping up and I know there's you know and, and I've kind of looked at some of the questions and give a, a context that maybe can can grab some of those things. I, I saw questions about um, you know kind of what drove the development of Haiti, what's going on reparations and kind of all these different things like that. My own response to this is that is that you know um, again as I said before there was a, a lot of you know, everybody really um, wasn't happy that there was black progress, and and I I, I give mm -hmm. um, um, you know credit to in some ways to to um, the Duke family. I think the Duke family mitigated some of what might have been uh, some some of the other kinds of black racism that we saw in the South. I mean, there there weren't hangings necessarily and things like that in Durham. There was racism, so I don't want to act like there wasn't. But but you know, a lot of things kind of drove this kind of. Um, um, destruction of black communities across the United States. And so uh, we saw that all around in terms of where we are now, I'd say part of the challenge around resources is that there's still a very paternalistic way by which um, the community looks at the black community. Uh, and so if, if you look at, for example, the way public dollars are spent, um, um, I looked at budgets at the, the city and the county over the last decade. And what I found was that what uh, I would call white in Durham is largely around this idea of wealth enhancing, right? So there's already wealth, public dollars were cited and kind of create more wealth. When it comes to the black community, those, um, um, when it comes to black community, those, those investments are largely, um, these investments that are social, so it's like, oh, well, we'll build your community center or we'll do something like that. And it's not the same. I mean, what made Haiti so unique was that the investments were going into entrepreneurs and people in the community and things like that, and not to say, well, hey, we're gonna build you a community center and we're gonna call that our investment or we're gonna build you public housing. So, so I mean, I, I say that to say that it's gonna have to be really a, a community effort to get behind um, the community um, around the idea of equitable investment. And that, and that really means putting real dollars um, into the community. I mean, it's not as if black folks don't pay taxes here, right? So it's not as if, you know, you were asking for anything that, that is not an investment. So I think it's important to recognize that, that what has to happen in Durham to really move forward around equity is gonna have to be something that is unprecedented in the real way. Uh, and it's gonna take everybody in the community of all shades and colors to get behind it, um, to, to create the public, the, the public sector will to make the kind of investments that, that um, you know, are needed really. I'm glad you mentioned that about taxes because at one time <clears throat> the area of Haiti and surrounding communities was the highest tax area in Durham at one time because of its progress and a number of businesses that exist. So we also realize that taxation is not always equitable or equally dispersed, but at the same time, we do have to rely on taxes to support the infrastructure as well as the rest of the city. I'm hoping that the paternalistic view, so to speak, would change, but that's kind of hard when you're dealing with the South because it ain't always paternalistic. It's something else other than paternalism. And that's part of the psyche of the South that has never changed. It may elevate or it may switch its design, but it doesn't basically change in terms of its attitude. And that's of a racial nature. But we can get beyond that. Back in the day when we see these buildings and stuff, which would be about the 50s or 60s, that's when the change started taking place. Civil rights movement, voting rights, things of that nature, which took place right there at St. Joseph and White Rock when we had people coming through such as Martin Luther King and all others who spoke in our city and gave us the motivation to move ahead, as well as our church leaders and community leaders and business leaders got together and pool, not just their resources, but pool their faith, their understanding and their wit mm -hmm. in order to be able to keep things going and keep us motivated uh, amid all the trials and tribulations that we faced. My, my final word to be is I, the lady kind of finished, but, but, uh, but one of my final things would be that um, as I travel around the United States and even the world and I do this work around equity and inclusion, 
I always say this, right? And it's true. I don't say it just because I'm from here. I say that, that you know, everybody talks about wanting to be equitable and racial equity and, and you know, we're black folks and things like that. Um, but nobody's there yet, um, including Durham. And what I say, what I, what I do say is that kind of piggybacking on what Reverend Reverend said, if for me, if there's any place that actually can do this and can be at the forefront of this, I actually believe it's Durham. And but we have to pull together the will and the efforts and the people to get behind this um, and get away from some of those things Reverend Brown talking about that that are uh, ahead of not not just paternalistic but the idea of keeping folks in their place and things of that nature. So I, I do believe Durham can be the prototype community on the planet for equity if we really wanted to and use the resources that we have. I agree. I agree. I hey, agree. my name is Kevin Jones. I'll be serving as a moderator today and we'll try to get to some of the questions that were asked during the presentation. Um, so the first question that we have is from Kathy. Um, her question is, I have been doing research on the Algonquin Tennis Club. Do either of you have any history to share on this spectacular club? I have one thought that comes to mind with the Algonquin Tennis Club. As it progressed, we noticed that one of our great tennis champs, uh, what was his name? Oh, God. That, that one Arthur, Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe. <laughs> as well as one Althea Gibson. Yes. yes. Came through and played. And also one of our pro basketball players who comes from Durham, John Lucas. John Lucas, absolutely. Was also a tennis player. Absolutely. And got the Junior Davis Cup award when he played tennis. Mm -hmm. So that's all I can bring to you about it. But it's a well-established old uh, tennis club that was set up to teach and to perpetuate sports, especially tennis, uh, in our community. The Algonquin. Okay, well, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the Algonquin also had uh, uh, rooms that were not on the street level, and they served to host and to house. Uh, political and other special black visitors to Durham as well, just like uh, the Biltmore Hotel did. Uh -huh. Okay, I, I, have, as well. I have another question from our very own James Davis Jr. Um, the question is, how does desegregation adversely affect the resiliency of Haiti businesses and the vitality of the community? Well, in a very basic, oh, well, well, I was just saying in a very basic way, I mean, um, economic integration, um, social integration, economic, particularly went one way, um, black money out of the black community into the white community, uh, white community, white dollars did not come into the black community. And so right. I mean, that was a huge part of what stripped the economic basis from the, the black community. Reverend. Yeah, uh, I was gonna pick, just pick back on that. Uh, that was basically it. When uh, during segregation, it was our own monies that kept us going and thriving in our communities because you couldn't live anywhere else. So the money was easily turned over. But when integration finally hit or desegregation, uh, things changed because our money left the community. And when your money leaves the community, so does your community. All right. Um, we have a question about one of the photos. So uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, in the photo of the North Carolina Mutual with everyone sitting out front, what did the 2018 mean that was painted on the window? Mm. The photo, uh, I don't recall that one. I'm not sure if we have access to that <laughs> photo to bring up. We'll have to we'll have to double back to that one. I have to see if we okay. can um, if we can kind of get that photo pulled back up so we can all kind of look at it at the same time. Okay. Um, we have a question from Patrick Burroughs. Um, the question is: Is it right that all of those buildings behind the Heritage Center have since also been destroyed? I know there's huge empty space. What's the history of that second demolition? When you say behind, where where exactly um, you're saying on the old Fayetteville Street side, or is that? It doesn't. It does not specify, but it just okay. says behind the Heritage Center. In okay. the picture that's currently up, 
the street side you see is the old Fayetteville Street side, which is the front of the Eighth High Heritage, mm -hmm. even now. Mm -hmm. On back of that, all the houses that you see back there, all of that has been gone mm -hmm. for many a year. Oh, uh, the new Fayetteville Street comes in back of houses. That's where the Fayetteville Street that runs through there now runs behind St. Joe. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going back to the other. Place. Yeah. So what they did, they took old Fable and made new Fable by taking the street and putting it behind St. Joe. So on old Fable Street, which was the original front of uh, Haytai mm -hmm. when it was the church, there are still some homes, some apartments. The Carolina Times um, building is there. Uh, and there's an EMS, but all of the other stuff is gone. Um, yeah. There's a there's a space where there's um, uh, an office park on the corner, and then, as Reverend Brown said, uh, Fayetteville Street. You know, that's that's a, a very wide corridor, mm -hmm. and everything that was there before is gone. Right. Okay. Um, the next question is: uh, Was Hillside Park white only? Hillside Park. Yes. Uh, no, it was a black park. It's the park I grew up in. <laughs> That's what I thought. Um, Wasn't no black folks go with it then. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is that since my uh, lifetime, it has always been a, a black park that was established for blacks in order that we would have a public place to go to because you couldn't go to the other parks in town. Right. So they established for blacks to attend in Hillside Park was one of them. You used to have a, a full length Olympic sized pool there as well as um, tennis courts and open field. Of course, the baseball field is still there, but all of that was put in back of old, the reason why it was called Hillside Park because it was put in back of old Hillside School. And that's how it got its name. All right, next question. Uh, with the death of Mr. Edmonds, I heard the Times future was uncertain. Does the Times continue today? So I think that um, the the paper has has passed on to the to the future to the to the current uh, family, and I think that you know when they have decided what they what they will do with it, then we'll know. But. I think just it hasn't been that long since uh, since Kenny passed. So um, they're they're just trying to be thoughtful about the decisions they make. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Uh, another question that came in: Where did the people and business businesses of Haiti go? Immediately, the businesses that survived, uh, especially that yellow circle that was on the map were moved to 10 city. And those that did not move to 10 city were initially stretched out down Fayetteville street primarily. And then um, of course you can see remnants today of family owned businesses that have survived in, in isolated parts of the city. And I say isolated because Haiti represented a business hub for us that we don't have anymore? Well, my father's business is located on Bacon Street, right across the street from R. N. Harris. Uh, he moved out and built a building in 1974 and has been there ever since then. And he used to have his business on Federal Street back in the late 50s until he moved from there. Uh, Ten City was Durham's answer to the problem of businesses going out of business right. and not enough space for people to go. But it really turned out to be a joke because you yeah. never could get a whole lot of businesses in that tin building. And a tin building could not represent a city, especially for a hundred plus right. you know, businesses that were on the verge of either going out or just being lost. So a lot of them just ceased to exist or struggled as hard as they could until they went out of business. So we are thankful for those who were able to survive, but it makes a big difference in the lives of the community for those who didn't survive. Because these were the ones that fed us, clothed us, 
provided shelter for us in an economic sense when blacks could not go to hotels, could not go to uh, supermarkets or grocery stores. And a lot of folks forget that. These, this was the place where we could go to a grocery store because it was operated and run by black folks who were being supervised by white folks. So it makes a difference in terms of how businesses go and how they stay alive. But uh, there was always a run and gun battle about 10 City. And the only business I've ever known to be in 10 City was uh, Scarborough and Hargett when they had to move back there. And also- uh, The Carolina. Green Candle. The yeah, Green Candle, yeah, Green Candle. Yeah, yeah. Um, so- Just, just, just as, I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead. What well, one example of an effort to survive because Ten City was not erected immediately in that little interim period. And for instance, my father, uh, who was forced off of Pettigrew Street, moved initially across the railroad tracks to the corner of Dillard Street, where uh, right now there's a, a Durham uh, County building, the General Services building stands there now. But my father uh, shared that space with another black owned business. But again, um, the, the efforts, the, the subtle and the political efforts to, uh, to squeeze out those businesses um, uh, kind of won over. So my father went from Dillard Street, then we ultimately moved all the products to our home. He worked from his home for as long as he could. And I'm sure there were other black business people and families who struggled to, to resist the change that was inevitable. Well, I, I, I like to, I like to say something real quick. I know we we over time anyway, but I think it's important to you know because we we often look back on these times and we think about them as being so distant and we kind of wax poetic and all this stuff. But this is still happening today, right? So I mean, if you think of so pandemic, I just wrote a chapter about I just did some analysis on kind of the, the payroll protection program that went out um, as part of this current um, kind of um, coronavirus response, and and we've seen in the last um, just in this year alone probably over um, close to 70% of the black businesses in the United States have gone out of business. I mean, that's an mm -hmm. enormous, uh, enormous number, right? But I say that because the black community, entire history of the America has always absorbed the blows of whatever has happened in the community and largely done it alone, right? Whether you're talking about the Great Depression, the Great mm -hmm. Recession, um, mm -hmm. And, and the reality of it is that this this urban renewal that some people call urban renew urban removal was the right. same thing, right? I mean, you had I mean, you know, think about what would happen if all of us living for the most part, I imagine living home. Imagine somebody showing up tomorrow and, and bulldozing our home. I mean, what would we do? Right. I mean, right. and so um, you know, I think you got to remember that. I mean, this is you know, we can we can kind of wax poetic about the past, but at the end of the day. I mean, folks came in and they just bulldozed businesses, they bulldozed houses. And now you, that on top of the fact that, that you know, even with McCann's and Farmers and, and Mutual, it's still redlining, there's still lack of access. Mm -hmm. And so business, black businesses did what, what any of us do, they went out of business a lot of it. And so again, we, we still see that um, right now uh, in the modern day where, you know, when something <laughs> happens and sometimes, you know, it just happens that this one was a, was a, um, a man-made kind of driven, history of the kind of oppressive nature versus, um, you know, the, the the kind of virus is spreading as we see it. So I, I just want to kind of make that connection that, um, you know, we still see the same kind of um, issues where when something tremendous happens, um, you know, the Black community is often left out there to, to fend for itself. And uh, and when the bulldozer went in and, and knocked down all these businesses and homes that, that Black folks have spent a lifetime um, creating, I mean, listen, to a lifetime creating and all of a sudden it's gone. I mean, how do you respond? How do you react to that? How do you respond from that? Right. Uh, and so that's the reality of, of what we know happened here. And these are the last couple of questions that I'll get to. We had one that came in. Is there any info about how the pandemic of 1918 affected the Durham Black community? So I'll say this now, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't have any specific um, um, information about the, the pandemic. I will say this though, I mean, I, I did write a paper on essentially the, the rise and fall of Haiti and kind of the contemporary times. I'm happy to make that available to anybody that wants to kind of read it uh, from that standpoint. Uh, but what I was gonna say is that uh, I did, as part of that paper, as part of that write-up, I did an analysis. And if you look at, uh, for those who knows, know what the, um, the Forbes 
um, you know, 400 is the richest individuals in the, in the United States, et cetera, et cetera. Four, 400, well, it wasn't the 400 at that time, but the four of the richest Americans actually started in 1917, uh, um, uh, around that time. I looked at the first list of the Forbes uh, richest Americans and the Duke family was on there. They were on there beside the, the Rockefellers, the Carnegie's. I mean, this just shows you really how rich the Duke family was. But I say that because in, at that same time in 1917, there were uh, a, 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 a enormous amount of black business, you know, of diverse kinds. And, and so it was, how do you, and so I, I think the question for me at the foundation of it is, how is it that a hundred and so years ago, you had more diverse black businesses and institutions in Durham than you do now. Because what I do know from, I don't know, again, I don't know how the pandemic affected in 1918, but I do know when I looked at the list in 1917, there were all these black owned businesses that were, you know, the, the, the hotels and the movie theaters and all those kind of things. And so, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's just telling that a hundred years later, it's a lot less uh, robust, you know, during that time. Quickly, let me say that with regarding the pandemic, it impacted the black community, but what saved it from being more devastating than it was, was the fact that we had black nurses who were trained at Lincoln and um, they were part of a, a larger organization of nurses across the country with the Red Cross, but black nurses uh, were not allowed in many instances to treat white patients, but at least they were able to tend to uh, folks in their own community. So um, again, having, access to a Lincoln hospital. We had our own hospital. We had our own health mm -hmm. system. Right, right. So that really prevented the outbreak from being even more devastating in the Black community. Okay. And we have the final question here. Um, I know this is more on the city side, but um, if you can answer it to the best of your abilities, of course. Um, and what are, the question is, what are current resources, Black businesses, the, excuse me, what are current resources for Black businesses in Durham? Well, so, you know, uh, like pretty much most, I won't say every city, but most cities have some aspect of, uh, you know, a minority program, things like that. I mean, Durham has a, in the workforce development office, they have folks that are um, working on, um, you know, trying to help um, minority businesses. You have um, like Double Giles and Eric Miller who are trying to get more procurement opportunities to, to black businesses and, and things of that nature. But I, I say this, um, and this is not a knock against um, any individual, but but again, I think most most um, cities have a very um, narrow viewpoint of what it really means to support um, black and black institutions, and and, and that usually uh, entails uh, just carving a little tiny piece of resources out to support those. And until we actually see um, black businesses uh, as a vital part of the community, and I say this, and then it looks like I need to say something, but. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to say was this, is that part of what actually built Haiti, um, because I think it's important to understand the history is that the black community in Durham solved a problem for the broader community. That problem was the fact that the Civil War, basically the, the end of the Civil War basically happened in Durham because the largest surrender happened at Bennett Farm, which we now know to be Bennett Memorial. Uh, essentially what happened after that was, um, you know, the farmers, I mean, the, the, the soldiers got their hand on some tobacco here and when they left out, Home, they said, wow, that's some great tobacco. They started writing back for orders. And then all of a sudden, um, Durham became the center of the tobacco world, not just the United States, but the tobacco world. There were not enough white folks in Durham to satisfy that demand in terms of workers for American tobacco. You had to have black workers who were a part of that network. And so blacks fulfilled a need um, in the workforce. And it happened, they went across the railroad track to do some work and get paid they brought the money back here and they used their entrepreneurial spirit to create this ecosystem. And so I say that to say that folks as the value of everybody as part of this engine, you have much better outcomes than the idea that we just need to solve a problem, this problem people. So let's figure out how to throw them a few pennies and maybe they, they, they won't get too mad. And so we have to reframe how we think about the investments in the black community. I need I see you ready to say something. Yeah, yeah. Briefly, you asked about city resources, but even before city resources, we do still have the UDI Community Development Corporation that uh, was developed to support uh, black 
uh, developing agencies, uh, both business, educational, and, uh, and served uh, to support other social service entities. Um, I uh, have been fortunate enough to, to serve as a staff member there with the late Ed Stewart and now Bill Bell. And um, they have a, a history of receiving uh, financial uh, grants and sponsorship for for uh, vi ideas which contribute to the viability of small business efforts. One example of uh, one of the grants and and a, and a project that I worked on and the the old Haiti now is the home place for uh, a remote business center that uh, for UDI as well as all of those homes around that business center were built by UDI and at least were, uh, when they were built, they worked with uh, black families and lower income families to, uh, to help them receive um, good housing. So uh, that, is, that is still a viable resource in support of uh, the Durham business community. One thing. In the arts community, we do have the Durham's Cultural Advisory Board, which is a resource. So, um, but we need more to support our artists. Yes. One thing. Um, for Haiti to be what it is, it's all because back in those days, Black folk owned land. They owned the land to a, to a degree, or either they were sharecroppers of land. Uh, the American Tobacco Factory and also those who produce products for tobacco in Durham had uh, many Blacks who supplied them with tobacco that they grew themselves and rode into town and dropped off. Now, we, a little history about that is you know that the Dukes originally come from Hillsborough, from Orange County, and they made their wealth after the Civil War by doing what was uh, Brother McCoy said as far as the tobacco farm, the tobacco industry. industry. But many black folks had to support it simply because that was the only means and ways of support that they had at that time to produce the cigarettes. But at the same time, it was the only means and ways that blacks could have their product being sold or given away to, to the industry. Also, these blacks who own farms and things like that when North Carolina Central today existed, they supplied food and services to the school in order to feed the students that were there, as well as driving through the community. Because I remember when they drove through the community, I was a kid, selling their wares off the backs of trucks and cars in terms of collard greens and your sweet potatoes, your corn, your cabbage, when you couldn't go to a grocery store and there was no grocery store to go to. So land is the main thing. You don't have any, ain't nothing you can do because you're gonna be paying rent to somebody else. <laughs> That's it. That is all of the questions we have for today. Laura, if you want to take it out, take it home from here. Sure. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I know that we still only really just like, you know, um, touch the surface of the history in Haiti, but I think um, from looking at what people are sharing in the chat, um, there's definitely more interest to continue. and. And we will share more resources um, as well, and a lot of the resources that you all have talked about today. So, yeah, I, I thank you so much for for sharing with us. Um, that was what the slide was about apparently. Um, thank you um, to everyone um, who spoke today and shared about Haiti. Also, thank you to all the city staff um, who helped to put this together and to um, our management and everyone else who supports. Um, like I said, we had over 357 RSVPs for this event. Um, I've heard people continuing to watch these on TV and on YouTube across the country. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to promote, I had several resources. I used to put uh, pull together um, photos for this presentation. Um, in addition to what Angela supplied for the uh, Haiti Heritage Center. And one of the main ones I wanted to share is Open Durham. If you haven't been to this website, it's really cool. Um, Haiti has a lot of history that's out there um, that has been documented. And this is just one example. Um, you can see for each of these dots, you can go and see 
um, pictures of what was there and, and kind of what it looks like more recently. And there are several other neighborhoods that are featured that ha don't have nearly as many dots. So I encourage um, you, if you have photos to share, um, please do so, so that they can continue to live on and um, share stories like we've done today. So that's um, opendurham.org. If you go under the neighborhood tabs and it'll um, help you get some of these. And then I wanted to share about some of our events coming up. Um, again, we have these, our community stories events once a month. Um, at the end of the year, um, for on December 11th, we're gonna kind of do a recap. So if you had a story about Hey Ty that you really wanted to share today, uh, let us know. And we can, we're just gonna uh, spotlight a few stories, but we wanted to revisit the communities that we've already talked to th this year, Walltown, West End, Bragtown, Crest Street, and now Hey Ty. So if you have a story you'd like to share from one of those communities, especially if you have a photo that goes with that, please let us know. And then um, in January, we will hear from Brookstown. And if you are wondering, where is Brookstown? Brookstown is one of the neighborhoods that was destroyed by 147. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't show up on maps today. Um, so I'm really um, honored that we will be able to hear and learn more about that community. We're also still uh, working to organize events to hear from the Bottom, East End, Albright, and Lion Park, or a few of the other neighborhoods we're trying to get to this year. And as I said, we've already covered a few um, uh, other communities this year. And if you haven't had a chance to watch those, those are available on our website and on YouTube. Um, that's, oh, that's, that's just my um, extra slides. Um, so that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, everybody who listened and, and yeah. tuned in. Thank welcome, you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It was thank a great you. opportunity. Thank you so much. Reverend Brown? Yes. I 